We are very pleased to be together in this discussion with Minister Morgan Johansson, uh, who is, uh, I understand, very interested in the subject of the research that our two Stockholm Prize winners have devoted their lives to uh, with such important findings. And I think we're all aware of the theme of gun violence uh, for which we need sound knowledge and effective countermeasures. Um, I would just like to illustrate uh, the work of our prize winners in relation to what is perhaps the central question of gun violence uh, for most advanced nations where people can afford to buy guns. And the question is whether the society should allow them uh, to buy guns. Um, having been born in the United States uh, with a high gun density relative to uh, the country in which I now live, the United Kingdom, I'm very conscious of the implications of this story that I want to tell you about, a story that happened recently in Florida when a 12-year-old uh, boy and a 14-year-old girl uh, were uh, escaping from a Methodist church foster care home uh, and very quickly found their way to a nearby house to which they broke in. And they just, uh, as you might say, that's what happens in Florida. They found an AK-47 and a shotgun. And the next thing that happened was that they were engaged in a 35-minute firefight with the local police uh, in which over 60 shots were fired. And they have now been charged with attempted first-degree murder. Now, I think that it's unlikely this story would happen in Sweden because to the best of my knowledge, a randomly selected house in Sweden is unlikely to have armament uh, at that uh, level of firepower. Um, but what's going on in the United States right now after uh, a paradox of rising gun ownership and declining gun violence over the last uh, several decades um, is sadly a reversal of the trend. And as we'll hear today, we know that uh, from the research of our prize winners, the reason gun violence went down while gun ownership was going up had to do with the number of households that had guns as opposed to the total number of guns. And the number of households with guns was dropping in the US, um, but now it's going back up because there are many more first time gun buyers uh, adding guns to homes that didn't have them. And this issue is one that many countries are facing about whether the solution is personal protection or to have a stronger community and a stronger state. I think this sets the stage for much of what we have to discuss. But the first thing I want to do is to hand the floor uh, in reverse alphabetical order to try to make up for a lifetime of Franklin Zimmering coming last since he was a school child uh, because of his uh, the first initial of his last name. Uh, and then I'm going to hand off to somebody who had a lifelong advantage uh, of the kind that happens to people born earlier in the year uh, in sports events because of school cutoff dates and enrollment. Uh, so we're going to try to uh, uh, even out the balance with Philip Cook. These are both outstanding people. I'm sure they don't mind who goes first, but I, I thought I'd just like to uh, reflect uh, with both of them on what is uh, the single most important conclusion uh, from your work, Franklin Zimring, professor at the University of California uh, Law School in Berkeley. What is, do you think is the most important conclusion from your work or the work of anybody else about gun violence uh, and possible effective countermeasures? Frank, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, I have spent a great deal more time uh, and energy uh, on uh, defining the problem than on designing solutions. And uh, probably the shorthand description of my major empirical work would be to be early in discovering and documenting and measuring the extent of instrumentality effects. Uh, the, does a weapon make a difference in the death rate? How great a difference? Under what circumstances? Uh, and uh, how does that influence the, uh, the 
the, the, the definition of the gun problem and the design of gun countermeasures. Thank you, Frank. Now, just for an opening uh, capsule statement uh, of, of the same uh, content to Phil Cook, if you could describe one important conclusion from your work or the work of others uh, about uh, dealing with gun violence in a world in which the gun population rises substantially every year, what, what would you uh, offer to Minister Johansson before he begins to ask you questions of his own? Yes, uh, good morning and, and thanks, Larry. Uh, first of all, let me endorse uh, Frank's uh, conclusion that the type of weapon matters uh, uh, and there remains some controversy about that, but I see it as established fact and absolutely fundamental to this entire discussion. In terms of uh, my contribution from some of my research, I would say uh, it could be that the general availability of guns is closely linked to their criminal use uh, and also their use in suicide. Uh, so that gun availability, on the other hand, does not affect the overall rate of criminal violence, but it does affect its intensity and its scope. So availability matters. Uh, that is the second pillar of gun control policy along with instrumentality. Great, well, thank you very much, Bill and Frank. And now, uh, Minister Johansson, I think you have just heard in a very clear and succinct form uh, the, the major research uh, conclusions that were the basis for the jury's motivation in giving the prize to them this year. But of course, they know many other things that you might be interested in. So please, now you're invited to ask them anything you'd like. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, hearing what each has to say about the other's answers. Uh, uh, if we can get to, into that discussion, but uh, the floor is yours, Minister. Uh, thank you, Larry, and and uh, once again, also thank you for for having this opportunity to uh, each year, which is to to have the opportunity to to have an exchange of of views with the world's top researchers and and academics. Uh, uh, every year, it's a real privilege, and uh, then again to have. To have Professor Cook and Professor Simring uh, now, who has studied the issue of gun violence, which I know know it has been a top discussion uh, discussion in the United States for many many years, but I must also say that actually it has been a top of the agenda even in Sweden in recent years. But uh, the the situation is a bit different here than it is in the United States because of that, as you pointed out. Um, I mean, the, our gun regulations are much more strict than they are in the United States. But nevertheless, we do have problems with some organized crime and they have the availability, they have uh, guns of their own that they are using against each other. So maybe we can get into that kind of issues, uh, the discussions later on. Uh, but let me first uh, just say that this is going to be a very interesting uh, discussion and, and again, to uh, to Professor Cook and Professor Simon Cooker, I would like to congratulate you to the to the prize. And uh, as I said, it's going to be a privilege to have this discuss discussion with you. Uh, let me start by by asking uh, Professor Simring that uh, I mean nowadays uh, I think there is a f there there is not many participants on, on this symposium that would question your research and your finding uh, your findings during uh, during uh, all of your research but could you tell us a little bit about how your findings were received when you started out doing your studies in the 1960s and the 1970s well, because I, yeah. I think there was some discussion even then about your findings would you would you could you elaborate about that a little bit about that it would be interesting well uh, uh, first of all problems uh, that confronted uh, 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 people that uh, wanted to oppose regulation uh, or for that matter, public policy attention on firearms. Uh, uh, when my work was first published and publicized uh, was to 
avoid the consequences that uh, uh, regulating the volume of guns available in the civilian population uh, would be an important part of uh, regulating the costs in uh, death and injury uh, from gun violence in the population um, uh, where the intervention was made. Uh, it, it was a fairly simple and fairly mechanical regulation that uh, uh, was called for and a fairly simple uh, and fairly easy to comprehend causal relationship. Uh, most of us knew long before I did or published any work uh, that we would vastly prefer uh, to be threatened or assaulted uh, uh, with a knife or a baseball bat or a stick uh, instead of to be shot. Uh, and so there was no uh, 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 a tremendous uh, technological uh, uh, advance uh, in comprehending that the number of guns uh, owned and used uh, would have a definite influence uh, on the cost of the violence that resulted. I think it's, uh, it's interesting that uh... Professor Zimmering is so kind to uh, the uh, huge uh, population that was furious at his findings and furious at him. Uh, but uh, I think it's it's fair to say that everything he said uh, uh, would would probably apply today in Sweden as well. But that is that discussion is still going on, of course, very vividly in, in the United States, isn't it? I mean, everybody who is questioning uh, the the. Uh, or, or, or establishing the, the connection between the, the number of guns out in, in, in the society and the, and the rate of, of violence, uh, or uh, that's a, quite a, a furious uh, debate, awakes a quite furious debate, uh, as, I, as I read it in the American debate. Yes, and with the central argument that uh, if people have guns to protect themselves, then uh, that will cause less crime and... Uh, uh, they will be safer from gun crime themselves because they can shoot back. And I think these are uh, issues uh, or counter hypotheses that both uh, Professor Zimmering and Professor Cook have grappled with repeatedly in very systematic uh, ways. And especially, I'd have to say, uh, with respect to looking at the differences in states in how much gun uh, population uh, in uh, terms of percentage of households how many guns there are in the states. And this has been the pioneering work uh, of using a, a standard metric for estimating gun density that uh, Philip uh, Cook has, has contributed. And it could even be applied to Sweden actually to, to see whether that's been going up uh, or not, whether it's still concentrated in the criminal gangs, which would be a very good thing uh, compared to the alternatives. Yes, and, and, and I can confirm that. I mean, the problem that we have is the illegal guns being uh, out, being uh, care, being uh, available to to uh, being carried by by the the criminal gangs. And but we still have, and uh, I mean, Sweden is also a country where, which have quite many people hunting. So we have quite many even legal guns out there, but it's very very seldom that the legal guns that people have are being used in, in violent crimes like, uh, like that it is in, in, in other, in, as, as I understand it is in, in the United States. But may I, may I then turn to, to uh, Professor Cook then with the, the, the uh, actually write that, that question that I know that you, you have developed uh, models that can roughly predict levels of lethal violence in different states across the United, the United States. Would you say that in general, well, there is a direct and consistent correlation between gun availability and, and lethal outcome? 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Minister. I think, um, so first of all, uh, the measure of availability that I developed and, and have used, as have a, a number of other investigators, uh, is validated against the percentage of households that have at least one gun, and, and particularly a handgun, since most of the crime and most of the suicides in the United States are committed with handguns. Uh, so that the connection there, uh, again, in the United States is that if you live in a, in a city where a high percentage of homes have a gun in them, then guns are relatively available to criminals uh, as well as to suicidal people. Uh, and the fact is that our, our criminal guns, our crime guns, are not ordinarily purchased at the store uh, because the people involved have a criminal record that uh, blocks them mm. from buying a gun at, at a, a gun dealers, illegal gun dealers. Mm. So when you say that in Sweden the guns are illegal, it is actually true that the crime guns in the United States are also for the most part illegal in the sense that they are in the hands of somebody that is prohibited from owning a gun. Uh, and the connection between household prevalence of ownership uh, and availability to crime uh, comes down to a question about how guns are diverted from legal ownership to illegal ownership. And, and that diversion is closely linked to prevalence of ownership. So it might be uh, theft through burglary, for example, uh, or it might be simply that uh, there are uh, the, the black market, the underground market, which works much better when there are a lot of guns uh, in circulation than if there's only a few. And so that's what my research was showing was that the criminal um, propensity to use a gun in a robbery, for example, uh, or in assault is not something that's distinct from the legal ownership of guns, that the two of them are connected. But let me cl just clarify one thing. So what, what this model predicts uh, uh, or, or what this type of analysis is predicting is the likelihood that if there is a crime then it will be that will be uh, involve a gun, uh, but it actually doesn't predict the amount of crime. So it, the the prevalence of gun ownership, the availability of guns, does not necessarily um, correlate with the amount of gun violence. What it correlates with is the likelihood that if there is violence, it will involve a gun. And for just the reason Frank says that that means it'll be more deadly, uh, it'll have greater scope to it, uh, it it'll do more uh, damage. I grew up on a farm in a farm community, everybody had a gun mm. in that community, uh, but there was no crime. Mm. And so there was no gun crime. Mm. It, it's in circumstances when you have both crime and guns that you have gun crime, mm. and that's the worst situation. Minister, you may know that Professor Zimmering's book is uh, called Crime is Not the Problem, and uh, what he's uh, done in that book, which impressed me when I asked my Cambridge students to raise their hands if they'd ever been assaulted, uh, with injury in a public place, and uh, over half the room put their hands up. Uh, I'd asked the same question at uh, the University of Pennsylvania in the United States, and maybe 5% put their hands up. So there's much more violent crime in England, uh, as, as Frank Simmering's work shows. Um, but the homicide rate is, um, you know, 500% higher. Uh, depending on which group you look at. And in some areas, it's more like 20 or 30 times higher in the US mm. with less 
violence and more murder. Mm. And that's where I think maybe Sweden or Europe generally um, may have with COVID. And I, I wanted to just ask you if you think Swedish people are more afraid of uh, home invasion or crimes coming to their home in COVID times and their home more. So are they being encouraged to, to buy guns? Because I think that's part of what's going on in the United States hmm. uh, with a more free market approach. Hmm. If I can ask that, uh, if I can answer that, I, uh, uh, you, you asked me if there is more people now buying guns in Sweden because they're afraid of of being assaulted because of the of the corona situation is that because they're home war and uh, yeah. might be uh, subject to invasions but that's the fear in the u.s i think uh, i'd say that no it's uh, it, it it is not a topic that has been discussed at at all <laughs> i would say uh because uh, of course there is i mean we've we've had for for a couple of years now problems with uh, gun violence between criminal groups, criminal gangs, and that is a cause of being more worried about that. But that that's not. The, but you are not worried that these people would uh, come home home and and invade your your home and 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 assault you. Uh, but people can be worried about just coming in 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 the crossfire when uh, when uh, this kind of violence occurs in in the streets that is what people are are being worried about but it's it's still i mean our our rates are, are, are the numbers here are, are still very very low but it is widely discussed in sweden because we've had this situation for a couple of of years and uh, we are dealing with that with increasing uh, the legislation strengthening the legislation against the illegal guns so nowadays just a couple of years ago we we uh, raised the the sentences for for gun for for having uh, guns illegal guns uh, we we doubled the minimum uh, penalty for for that and we also made it much easier to to uh, incarcerate people when uh, put them in 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 um, uh, uh, incarceration when 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 you when you are being um, uh, when the police are are are, uh, are uh, getting taking you on, on the streets and so on. So we are now actually we are filling the the jails and the prisons now with those kind of people who st who have quite uh, I mean have been involved in criminal gangs and been involved in that kind of violence. And uh, but we are doing that by strengthening our our already quite um, strict gun laws even more so in order to get get out get get the streets uh, get the, the the guns uh, off the streets and the people who are carrying guns uh, off the streets and in, and in jail and i think uh, we now for the in the beginning of this year we had a, a decrease actually of the number of of uh, shooting incidents since we by, by almost 40 percent a decrease going down uh, for just one uh, the, in the beginning of, of this year. And I think uh, if we keep on doing that, we will have a, a positive, positive. Uh, situation, situation. Uh, a better situation in that way, in that sense. But uh, I, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to follow up with, <laughs> with the questions also to, to Professor Simring and, and Cook though, about your some of your findings. You, Professor Simring, you, you published a book in the light, late 1990s uh, and we, in which you said that, uh, if I understand right, that it, it's not a crane. Yeah, I lost you. Ah, do you? No. Ah, um, are, are we back? Yeah. <laughs> I I understand that in the 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 uh, in the late 90s you published a, a book in which you you argue that it's not the crime rate that's the problem in the United States or the or that distinguishes it from other countries. It's rather the high gun use. In crime, in crime, and consequently, the often lethal outcome because of that. Would you say that that conclusion is still valid uh, today? And which oh, is overwhelming. Which is, come again. Overwhelmingly. Over, overwhelmingly. As I understand it, then for the last year or so, the the number of of uh, gun of shootings and gun violence has increased quite much in the United States. 
uh, in the United, you hear that in New York it is almost doubled, and in Minneapolis it has gone out, up also, and many connected to to uh, yeah, what has happened f after uh, George Floyd's death and so on. Would you would you say something about that? Why? How come the numbers are going up in in, uh, in United States? In your well, uh, uh, the the first thing to note is that the base uh, for American gun violence uh, in the very recent past uh, was substantially lower uh, than it was uh, for the decades uh, after essentially uh, uh, 1980 uh, that uh, 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 preceded uh, the most recent modern era. So uh, 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 we are in, in, in some sense uh, victims of our own prior success uh, or at least uh, 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 good fortune uh, uh, because uh, base rates were low enough uh, so that uh, 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 increases looked very dramatic. Now, that's a lot of guns by any international and particularly European standard. Uh, but by the, the, the previous more adventuresome uh, era uh, of uh, American violence in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, it was still uh, relatively good news. Hmm. But as I, as I understand it, it has increased again the number of shootings in, uh, in some of the big cities in, in the US just to the last year. Yes. yes. Uh, and, uh, and these increases, uh, you see, part of the interesting thing about this conversation, which is an international conversation, Mr. Johansson, mm -hmm. that uh, from your perspective, uh, the numbers, including the increases, are extremely large. Mm. Uh, from an American perspective, mm. they're concerning. Uh, and uh, uh, the arrow is not pointing in an encouraging direction. Mm. But the, the volume and the extent to which it constitutes uh, a approximate current risk for life-threatening violence on the street mm. is by no means in 2020 uh, uh, dramatically higher uh, than uh, the uh, uh, decades uh, of the modern era uh, uh, th that began in the 1960s. Uh, this is uh, a fluctuation within uh, 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 substantially uh, not unstable uh, long-term uh, lethal violence uh, uh, risks. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. Do you? Well, I, I just should say that um, Minneapolis is one of the cities uh, that uh, has had its homicide rate double and shootings up 105 percent. Um, my daughter lives there with uh, my grandchildren and her husband, and um, and many uh, Swedish uh, immigrants' descendants uh, mm. in the community. This is a place in which, in absolute terms, the murder rate is uh, now much higher uh, than uh, Sweden, I think, has ever seen its murder rate, um, at least not in the last century. And so what 
we concern ourselves with is why this is happening. And I have to uh, bring up, I think in this juncture, the, uh, the tragedy of uh, George Floyd's death, his murder being compounded by the um, uh, uprising against the legitimacy of the American police who have responded by essentially withdrawing from frontline policing and stopped trying to get the guns off the street. And if you wanted to perform a natural experiment, in what is the effect of the police not going out to try to stop people from carrying guns illegally on the street, I think we're getting the result, uh, not only in Minneapolis, but New York and many other major cities. Um, and, and it is a, um, in a way, it's, a, it's an extension of the findings of both Professor Cook and Professor Zimmering that when uh, gun density uh, in the population can be measured not by guns in houses, but guns in people's clothing pockets uh, out on the street, that uh, the immediate implications for homicide rates um, are very substantial. And we, what I've been trying to do um, in a British context where knife crime is having much the same kind of pattern is, is to figure out a way by which we can use the methods of stop and search in a way that seems racially fair uh, and also um, uh, appropriate for and proportionate for the nature of the problem. Um, and, and I think that that is in a way, uh, since we decided to give the prize to professors Cook and Zimmering, what has really changed about guns is the, um, the sort of defunding of the police and their role in trying to keep the guns off the streets. So to the extent that you're seeing drops in gun crime in Sweden, uh, I would hope that uh, somewhere in that story is that the police are doing something right about that, uh, as opposed to just benefiting from a natural trend with COVID. Um, and I, I'm sure all of our listeners would be fascinated, uh, including our two prize winners, uh, if you had insights about that. But I, I certainly ask them what they think about the situation in the US with the huge rapid increase in general homicide rates. Yes, I'd, I'd like to hear if, both from Professor Cook and Professor Simring about that, because uh, what you're saying here, uh, Larry, is that that the increase for the last year in cities like New York and Minneapolis that we've been talking about, that can be connected that the police have, in a way, uh, taking a step back, that they are not doing, they, they are not, <laughs> they are no, no longer uh chasing the guns uh off the streets and, the, and that means that people uh, are actually carrying guns on the streets in a way that they didn't do before even the people who are not uh, who are not allowed to to do that and that would, would be interesting to hear from the professors what you say about that if it can be connected to to the discussion uh the the the, what has happened after uh, George Floyd's uh, death and all the all that that discussion that you have in the U.S. I can I can fill in from from the Swedish perspective. I, I mentioned before that in 2018 we doubled the penalties for uh, for uh, the the severe gun crimes, which means that that if you you're, if you're carrying a gun on the street that you are not allowed to have. It, carrying an illegal gun before the leg we changed the legislation that meant that if the police caught you they just took you to the they arrested you and they, they took you to the police uh, headquarters and they and they questioned you and after that a couple of hours they released you and they, you were out on the streets again awaiting the trial then that would come up in a couple of weeks or so on but that meant that you were out on the streets again just after a couple of hours or the day after when we strengthened the legislation, we said that no, uh, when you are being caught with an illegal gun on the streets, that means that you are being put in a in a in a detention. In a uh, again, uh, you will be detained in waiting in awaiting for the for the trial. So that and you will be will be put there. And in the detention center, in the wait for the trial, and that meant that we nowadays, uh, we after that, we we actually uh, uh, more than quadrupled the number of of people that uh, being put in detention center because of that. 
And the police after that said that the effect on that was that people in the these gangs and uh, these organized crime gangs, they do no no longer carrying their guns in, in the street. They are leaving it at home. So they find many more guns when they are doing um, search warrants in their in people's homes than instead of having them, them out on the streets. And of course, that would also have a chilling effect because if you run 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 into someone that you have a conflict with you do you do not automatically try to solve that by pulling your gun because that's you have to you have to go go back home first and to find it and after that maybe the situation has changed so uh, but it would be interesting to to hear from the professors how how you see the the connection here about how the police are working against illegal guns and the 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 uh, availability to guns uh, from this illegal, <laughs> from this organized crime gangs, and how the how you see the current situation in the U.S. Uh, today, and why the we have the increase for the last year or so in in the United States. It would be very interesting to hear from you, if you have can share your, share your thoughts about that. Well, okay. Jim, I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead, Phil, please. Yeah, I, 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 um, I would be glad to talk about it. I, you know, first of all, the, the increase in gun violence and in homicide in the U.S. in 2020 is not exactly known, but it's well over 30%. It, it's the largest increase in recorded history. It is certainly noteworthy. Uh, and the idea that we have... COVID as a, um, and the George Floyd demonstrations as an experiment on police disengagement and what difference it makes is interesting, but it's unfortunately an experiment confounded by a lot of other things that were happening in 2020. And it's gonna be hard to tease out the different influences. Uh, so let me just point to the fact that there's been a, an enormous surge in mental health uh, issues, drinking has gone way up, gun sales are, are way up. Uh, and then we had a lot of kids who were home instead of in school because the schools were closed and so on and so on. So I, I think it is the messiest uh, kind, kind of, of story to tell. Uh, but it makes sense that there was uh, some uh, disengagement and in, especially in some cities. In Chicago, the, the city that I pay the most attention to, they actually uh, maintained their very high rate of gun seizures during 2020. So there wasn't a reduction uh, in, in that area, but they did have a 50% increase in shooting. So um, I, I think that the full story here is uh, just bound to be complicated and it's uh, probably uh, best to be modest in, in terms of our ability to actually understand what's going on. But there, there's a different kind of evidence rather than saying what happened in 2020 is to say what have we learned from uh, interventions that have more experimental quality and, and where there is a possibility of it identifying a particular cause and effect relationship. And I know you're interested in these uh, group violence interventions. Um, that I think is one of the best documented types of interventions where the police actually bring a gang in uh, to this, um, to, to, uh, to tell them that uh, the regime has changed, that the police and other law enforcement agencies are going to take their gun misuse very seriously in the future. They back that up by uh, arresting a bunch of people often. Uh, and they deliver this message in person and back it up with uh, credible evidence that, that really is going to change things. So. It, it's not that there's an effort to shut down the gang, whatever it's up to as a regular matter, like dealing drugs. Um, 
but it, it is instead to just say what we are not going to tolerate is gun play and shooting other people. Uh, there is an alternative approach for Sweden and other countries, which is in fact to try to shut down the gang, uh, to uh, attack the gang's uh, assets uh, and to say, you know, the goal is actually to, to uh, make it no longer uh, powerful at, as a cohesive unit uh, by using whatever civil and, and criminal uh, possibilities are, are available. But that's not been the predominant approach in the US where it has been very much to say, we're going to continue enforcement on drug dealing and so on at a normal level. But the, the, what has changed is a very clear focus on gun misuse. Uh, and we're going to arrest you individually, not as a gang, uh, to the extent that, that we have any kind of reason to think that you've been involved in, in that. And that has consistently worked. I mean, it, it's been uh, effective. Uh, in Sweden, you may have, um, you know, much more organized and professional gangs where it would be better to go after the gang itself. Uh, but I, I think that's a choice that, that needs to be made. I'm, but I, I did want to just mention the book that Professor Zimring wrote, uh, not about these focused approaches on gangs or what's called focused deterrence, uh, but a, a more general uh, geographic strategy that he describes in his book, The City That Came, Became Safe, which was about New York City having the biggest drop in homicide uh, recorded in the modern era. And uh, Frank, if you could tell the minister a bit about that and how you think it might bear on this question of why New York's murders and shootings have gone up so much in the past year uh, in light of all of the confounding factors that uh, Phil Cook was talking about. Well, <clears throat> Uh, uh, first of all, if you, if you take a, a relatively long view of crime and violence in New York, uh, the increases in the 1970s and 1980s uh, were substantial by dimensions that European readers and listeners uh, uh, could hardly comprehend. Uh, uh, we were talking at the peak in New York about homicide rates, and those were uh, 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 overwhelmingly firearms homicides, mm -hmm. of 30 per 100,000 per year. That's an enormous base. Mm. Uh, uh, the good news about that is that there's, of course, a tremendous room to drop and substantial public health benefits uh, if one can push the arrow down. Mm. Uh, and to some extent, that's exactly what happened. Some of that was probably variation independent of uh, law enforcement or specific interventions. But the 1990s uh, and uh, the 2000s were also a period of focus, firearms oriented uh, 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 criminal justice interventions. Uh, and they had a contributing effect uh, on uh, the, the, the downward uh, the progress uh, that has been noted. So this has been one area uh, where what law enforcement could do was not irrelevant uh, to a uh, uh, a, a public health and crime problem mm 
of substantial uh, public concern. Hmm. Well, I think we're just about out of time, Minister. We don't want to thank you for your taking uh, time to have this conversation with our winners. And uh, we're all looking forward to hearing their prize lectures, um, uh, which uh, I should point out uh, for anybody who wants to be able to read them. Uh, I, I think they're going to be appearing or have appeared in the journal called Criminology and Public Policy, published by the American Society of Criminology in honor of their winning uh, the Stockholm Prize. Uh, so my congratulations uh, to them again for that. And um, uh, my regrets that I won't be joining all of you at the banquet, uh, mm -hmm. at least not this year. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Lord willing, perhaps we will all uh, do that in Stockholm, uh, along with many of the viewers of this uh, conversation this morning. And we thank them for participating. And I thank my colleagues on the jury, especially Professor Sarnetsky at the University of Stockholm, uh, who I know is uh, uh, going to be uh, sharing the link to this uh, discussion around widely uh, in the very active community of uh, uh, crime policy um, uh, thinkers in, in, in Sweden. So may I thank you again, Minister, and uh, my thanks to Professors Cook and, and Zimmering for all of their hard work on these important issues. And uh, may I also then uh, thank you, uh, Larry, for for uh, uh, this discussion and especially, of course, the Professor Simring and, and Cook for, for this uh, very interesting exchange of, of views. And uh, well, as you said, there were going to be an, an ongoing program uh, here and we'll, we'll just have to do the best of the situation while we, while we have to, to, <laughs> to live with the situation right this year. But once again, I hope to, to see you all in uh, Stockholm next year, and uh, we then we can can uh, keeping on with with this discussion and with the, all these issues and items that that are so interesting also from our point of view. So once again, uh, I would like to congratulate the laureates for to the prize, and uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, next year and. Uh, and uh, let's uh, then take uh, continue with the, the program from from now on so thank you very much thank you all right